Hello, I'm Brandon Thomas and welcome back to Anchor Management. It's been a while since we've been on the air, so we have a lot to talk about, including the College Football National Championship game, fired and hired coaches around the NFL, and the Super Bowl. But we lead off with the tragic passing of an NBA legend, Kobe Bryant. Just 10 days ago, the sports world was rocked with the news of the helicopter crash in Calabasas, California, where the former Los Angeles Laker of 20 years was involved in a helicopter crash that claimed his life along with eight others, including Bryant's daughter, Gianna. The Lakers canceled their showdown with the Clippers last Tuesday as they mourned the loss, and many 24-second shot clock violations and eight-second backcourt violations were taken around the NBA this past week to honor Bryant's two jersey numbers, eight and 24. I now bring in my great friend and co-host, Jake Fitzgerald, to ask him what was your first reaction when you heard this? I was just in complete shock. I mean, I honestly didn't think it was true, and I saw the story build, and just when they finalized that there was nine people dead and it was Kobe Bryant and his daughter it was just unbelievable. He was so young, fresh into his retirement, an ambassador of the league. He's going to be there, we thought, for all these years to just look at, look back at his career and it's just crazy. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. Yeah, this was first reported by TMZ, by the way, and um, I'm playing with Uno with my family and it comes up on my Instagram feed as I'm going through the Explore. I'm like, there's no way this is true. And yeah. then I look after one of the rounds, I looked on my Twitter feed and a verified reporter says it's true. It's like, that's, and Bryant was doing so much with outside of basketball. He was bringing women into the game. He just said a couple days ago that he was going to, he said three WNBA players could play in the NBA right now in a regular rotation. And he was helping his, his daughter's team. Yep. There's Three, three of those players were involved in that helicopter crash as well. There was three of those players that he helped, and, and he loved his daughter doing all those things with her. She actually brought him back into the NBA. You see him yeah. on the sideline high five and LeBron and all the Lakers, and he was supposed to go to the Lakers game that they played on Friday night against the Trailblazers, and – it's, it's just sad all around to see yeah, all this is. develop. And speaking of LeBron James, it's crazy how he just passed Kobe on the, the all-time scoring night. list. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And Kobe tweeted out at him and congratulated him. And That's his last tweet. Yeah, I know. It's, it's seriously like passing the torch on to yeah. LeBron. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Moving on, Super Bowl took place on Sunday, and it was the Kansas City Chiefs being the San Francisco 49ers 31-20 to in Miami. Patrick Mahomes won MVP in the victory, throwing two touchdowns, and he also had a rushing touchdown. Casey's Damian Williams had one rushing touchdown and a receiving touchdown. BT, what are your thoughts on Super Bowl 54? We've covered the NFL all season with this show. We've covered the Chiefs' lows and the Chiefs' highs. They've had so many injuries, injuries yeah. and such throughout the year. But once this team came together after that bye week and they started to play the Raiders and the Patriots, this team came together, and we knew that this was going to be – a team that was a threat. They kind of got off a little bit not having to play the Ravens, but to the Super Bowl itself, they they struggled early. That's well documented. It was, they were down 20 to 10, and just going into the game, they really got their offense going. And yeah, that's it, just it was crazy to see their playoff run this year being yeah. down early in every single playoff game. Yeah, and being able Patrick Mahomes is a great leader. Great, he's leader. A, he's young quarterback, but he's already showing like Tom Brady leadership skills where he's able to regroup the team and come back in playoff games. And it's hard to do, and that's I give him credit. Very hard to do. I mean, that's probably one of the reasons he deserved to win MVP. Yeah. I mean, Damian Williams also had a great game, but I think he should have won MVP. He played a really good game, but. I mean, it's hard to argue with Mahomes the leading that team throughout yeah, exactly. the entire postseason. It's it's a tough situation all, all around with Mahomes getting MVP, but a lot of people maybe think it might be Damian Williams. Yeah. It's a little... Overall, it was a pretty solid Super Bowl. It was a very I mean, solid Super Bowl. A suspenseful fourth than last year. quarter. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it was a good game. It's a very good game. Other than Kobe, the news of the decade has been the Houston Astros being found guilty of using technology to steal signs during the 2017 season when they went on to win the World Series. If you haven't been keeping score, here's all you need to know about the fallout. Astros general manager Jeff Lunau and manager A.J. Hinch were both suspended for one year in their role in the scandal and both have been since fired by the Astros organization since. Major League Baseball will fine the Astros $5 million and take away their first and second round draft picks in the upcoming 2020 and 2021 drafts. 
The aftermath is being felt all around by baseball. And the next domino to fall was the Boston Red Sox parting ways with their World Series winning manager, Alex Cora, who was the bench coach for the Astros during 2017 and is expected to receive harsh punishment for his role in the incident. His punishment will be announced after the conclusion of the investigation of the 2018 Red Sox after they allegedly used video replay room to steal signs during their World Series run in 2018. Carlos Beltran, an outfielder on the Astros, was hired as the manager of the New York Mets this offseason. And as part of the fallout, the Mets and Beltran parted ways. Jake, is this punishment for the Astros too much, not enough, or just right? I think it's not enough. I think this is a very, very crucial issue in the MLB. And I think that they need to raise the punishment for these managers. I think the players should also have some sort of suspension. But it's hard to tell exactly all the players that were involved. But I think that as a team and the GMs, they definitely need to raise the punishment up because it affects so many aspects of the game. Yeah. Young pitchers that were called up to face the Astros and they just get shelled because they know what pitch is coming. It's just not fair. And I think it really, really hurts the MLB. So I think Major League Baseball needs to have a very strong punishment, more than what they already did to these general managers and the teams involved. I think this punishment is a precedent setter. Like this is the least that we're going to accept as far as like a punishment goes. Yeah. Any, anything after this is going to be much, much worse for everybody involved. I think the punishment isn't enough like you said, but it's a precedent setter that can really make sure that this punishment, and it will never happen again if this were to happen in the future with a future team that goes on and does yeah, well. Yeah, I think uh, even uh, there's the probably more well. teams that do some sort of, oh, I mean, yeah. stealing signs is always something, but using technology yeah. to steal signs is just on another level yeah. that isn't tolerable. It's yeah, not tolerated. Yeah. Moving on, the national championship game was played last month between LSU and Clemson. LSU was led by another dominant performance from Joe Burrow as they took down Clemson 42-25. to The Heisman Trophy winner Burrow threw for 463 yards and five touchdowns, making his college football playoff total 956 yards and 12 touchdowns between the Peach Bowl and the national championship. He is widely expected to go number one in the NFL draft next, this year to Cincinnati. So, BT, how good of an NFL player will Joe Burrow be? I think he's not – he won't be, like, a really good quarterback to start. He'll he'll morph into it, especially if, if he's with the Bengals. He's not going to be great right away. He'll Yeah. He will be great as the years go on. I mean, there's quarterbacks that, that are taking number one that don't really hit their stride until a couple of years because the team they're drafted on. Look at Jameis Winston. Yeah. I mean, I think – it's hard to say. I mean, there's so many quarterbacks that are drafted later in the draft, and they come into the NFL. No one really talks about them, and then they win a then lot. Then they're of, the like ones Tom Brady, for well. example, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of quarterbacks like, like that. But then there's also a lot of quarterbacks that go number one, number two overall, and they really just aren't that good. Even Patrick Mahomes wasn't really talked about yeah, a whole he, lot. Yeah. But I think that's more or less because Alex Smith was the quarterback and he mm -hmm. was established, but then it, all of a sudden he wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll see what happens with Burrow. I mean, hopefully Cincinnati can find another franchise quarterback. I mean, they've had quarterback issues now for a while. Yeah. So Dalton's been there a while, but he's but just yeah, not he's that been, good. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> the head coaching carousel has came and gone. In our last episode, it feels like a decade or so since Ron Rivera was fired by the Carolina Panthers only to be hired by the Washington Redskins the day after the regular season ended, while the Panthers hired Baylor head coach Matt Rule. The Dallas Cowboys finally ended their tenure with Jason Garrett as their head coach, and they brought in former Packers coach Mike McCarthy. The New York Giants let go of Pat Shermer after two seasons and hired the Patriots special team coordinator and wide receivers coach Joe Judge. And then the Cleveland Browns fired Freddie Kitchens after one year and hired Vikings offensive coordinator Step Kevin Stefanski. Jake, out of these five coaching changes, which one do you think is the best? I think the best one is the Dallas Cowboys hiring Mike McCarthy. Interesting. Um, um, Aaron Rodgers tweeted something about how about them hiring McCarthy, and he said it's a good hire if you want to go 8-8. Eight and eight. But I think Aaron Rodgers also forgot that that was the same coach that led them to a Super Bowl in 2010. So I think it's just kind of, 
ironic that he said that, but I think it is a good hire for um, the Cowboys. I think Prescott and him will work well, and I think it's a coach that they need. I think it was time for them to step away with Garrett. So It's a good hire, but long term, I think the best hire is Ron Rivera going to Washington. Um, we have Dwayne Haskins there as a quarterback. You got a bunch of guys that are expected to get Chase Young in the draft. They have a lot of great pieces now that it, it's just going to be a building process. And Ron Rivera was the guy that took the Panthers from getting Cam number one overall to go into 15-1. and one. I think he won two Coach of the Years with the Redskins. That's true. This is but a what, what happened in the playoffs, though, with them? Right. They, they still made a Super Bowl. I mean, they've, true. they've lost playoff games, but they've gone to a Super Bowl. Rivera's been a guy that can turn around a franchise, but Redskins haven't been good. But I still think this is a really good hire. Which coach do you think is going to last the longest? That's hard to say. Um, probably whoever's um, who's with the Browns, he's probably not going to be there long. I mean, they, no. they, they go through coaches like crazy. Probably Rivera with the Redskins. I'll, I mean, I, I can see that. Either him or Matt Rule with the Panthers. I can see yeah. rule lasting a while there. Yeah, we'll see. Back to baseball. Nearly the entire baseball offseason has happened since our last show, and plenty of big moves have come with it. Steven Strasburg stayed with the world champion Washington Nationals. AL Cy Young runner-up Garrett Cool signed with the Yankees. Anthony Rendon went to the Angels. And just yesterday, the Red Sox traded Mookie Betts and David Price to the Dodgers. BT, what team has had the best offseason so far? First of all, we got to talk about this Mookie Betts trade. I'd, yeah. I'd, we'd be remiss if we just completely ignored it. That was It's a big deal. Yeah. The Red, the Red Sox trading Mookie Betts, I mean, this is a move widely expected to happen because they really didn't want to pay him. Yeah. But he's one of the best outfielders in this game. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But as far as the team that had the best offseason, I, I think that's the team that got the best pitcher out of all of this, and that's the Yankees. They, they've had – pitching problems throughout the season it corrected a little bit in the playoffs but you now you have a solidified number one pitcher your number yeah. one pitcher is now Garrett Cole he's probably one I of agree the best in the NFL MLB. MLB yeah I agree with that but it's hard he had such a dominant season yeah it's really hard for him to have that again especially in Yankee Stadium but I think it is probably the Yankees are having one of the best off seasons with that signing. Yeah. But I also think the Dodgers too with that trade yesterday. Dodgers, it's hard yeah. not to look at them and say that they had a better off season. But I, I mean, we'll see. I'm we still know who the favorites are. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the Yankees and the Dodgers. But I know who didn't have a good off season. The Astros. <laughs> they didn't have a good off season. The NFL honors were this past weekend, where the best players in the NFL were recognized for their great seasons. Lamar Jackson won Most Valuable Player unanimously. Michael Thomas won Offensive Player of the Year after setting the record for most receptions in a single season. And the award that was met with the most controversy was Stephon Gilmore winning Defensive Player of the Year. Many people believe T.J. Watt should have won the award. Jake, are you one of those people? Yeah, as a Steelers fan, it's hard not to want your players to win awards. Yeah. And especially when a Patriots player wins and T.J. Watt is very close. I mean, I think he should have. Statistics speaking, I mean, they both had really good seasons. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think Gilmore is a huge reason why, I mean, the Patriots' defense really carried them throughout the season. And the Steelers' defense did too, but the Steelers' offense just – couldn't keep up with anything, but obviously Tom Brady can. So I just think that it probably was the right move giving it to Gilmore. What do you think? I think it was the right move giving it to Gilmore. I think if the Steelers made the playoffs, I think this yeah, is, a, is a much more difficult decision for voters. If I mean, you got a guy in the playoffs who has a franchise record in sacks and just doing everything on the line, getting to the quarterback, rushing, and all that good stuff. But I still think Stephon Gilmore is – the guy that should be the defensive player of the year. He he was a lockdown defender on the corner all year. He got Juju week one and and never looked back from there. Yeah. So the NFL is set for a very interesting free agency period coming up next month with many great players set to hit the market, including Drew Brees, Dak Prescott, and most notably Tom Brady, who hit free agency for the first time in his career. 
Rumors are swirling whether the 42-year will stay a New, Eng a New England Patriot or go to places like Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and maybe even San Francisco. BT, where do you think Brady will play next year? I think the wide speculation is that he'll stay right where he's at in New England. I don't think he would – I don't think he'll go anywhere else. But the speculation is a lot of fun, that's for sure. There's also rumors they might go to the Dolphins too. I mean, what do you think about that? There's just too many teams to <laughs> count. There's I think a couple all, the, teams, all the teams are <laughs> – All the teams are sort of in play. I mean, if you can get Tom Brady for one or two years, then – why wouldn't he you try? He's 42 years old, he's 42. Though. He wants to play for another three years. He wants to play until he's 45. I think he's going to stay in New England. I just think that it's just, I don't know, it's just hard to see him in another uniform. But I think he's going to stay in New England. I think he, his goal is to win a Super Bowl with an undefeated record. I think that's his goal. I don't think that'll happen. I think it could. but It I, could. I think that's definitely his goal. Not with the Patriots. Yeah, he might, they, have, to, he might need, have to go to San Fran. They need help. While it's a long ways away, the NFL 2020-2021 season will be here before we know it. The Chiefs are the favorite to win the Super Bowl next February in Tampa Bay, while the Ravens sit right behind them. The NFC champion 49ers have the third best odds. The Saints sit in fourth. And the New England Patriots we just talked about round out the top five. Jake, who's your favorite to win it all next season? It's hard not to look at Kansas City again and mm -hmm. say that they have a good shot. They definitely do. Um, New England, I mean, with Tom Brady and not knowing if he's going to stay or not, it's hard. And they're not as good as they were, I think, as a team overall. It's hard to say that they have a solid chance. But I think I can definitely see the Battle of the Birds in Super Bowl next year. Baltimore Ravens versus the Seattle Seahawks. Oh, yeah, I, I, can, was, I can see that. Happening. I was going to bring up Seattle as one of the teams I'm looking at. It seems like every year in the NF, NFC West, it's, there's a new team that's winning that division. Yeah. And in line, though, it would probably be Seattle next year. But they have a really good quarterback in Russell Wilson. We know that. If it wasn't for Lamar Jackson, he would probably be the MVP yeah. of the league. And I look at the Ravens, like you said, and if the Ravens can win a playoff game, that's the key. Win yeah. a playoff <laughs> game, then you can get to the Super Bowl 55 in Tampa, but you can't get there without winning one playoff game at home. Yeah. It's, they're all win two at home in the playoffs. That's, that's, that can't happen. Yeah, I can also maybe see Green Bay. Maybe, but... They, they need do. some help. Yeah, they do. Yeah, but I think a team that a lot of people will be talking about if... They can get healthy again, and that's the Pittsburgh Steelers. If they can get another weapon offensively and Ben comes back healthy, I think they can be a, a true threat for the Super Bowl next year. Maybe they'll get Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's time for our last say. The NBA All-Stars were selected over the last couple weeks, and the top of the reserves for the Western Conference was Damian Lillard. Lillard has thrived this season when his team at times has not. And over the last six games, not including last night against the Nuggets, Lillard has been on a historic stretch. He has scored 61 against the Warriors, 47 against the Mavericks, 51 against the Pacers, 36 against the Rockets, 48 against the Lakers, and 51 against the Jazz for an average of 48.8 points per game. While pointing up this historic scoring run, Lillard has been more than a scorer. Over this six-game stretch, Lillard has had 7, 8, 13, 11, 10, and 12 assist, game, assist games, averaging 10 assists over that six-game stretch. Lillard became the first player in NBA history to average at least 45 points and 10 assists over a six-game stretch. The first seven seeds in the West appear to be locked up, so the Portland Trailblazers are in the midst of a playoff race for the eighth seed with the Pelicans, Grizzlies, and others. If the Trailblazers want to be playoff bound in April, they'll need Lillard to continue to be great. This past week, five modern NFL players were selected in the NFL Hall of Fame. One of those players just happens to be one of my favorite football players growing up. That player is former, Pitts former Pittsburgh Steelers safety Troy Palomalu. Palomalu was in his first year of eligibility to be selected into the Hall of Fame, and he did not miss a beat, being selected as a first ballot Hall of Famer. In 12 seasons with the Steelers, Paul Molly was an eight-time Pro Bowler and was named Defensive Player of the Year in 2010. In that year, he had 63 tackles, seven interceptions, and a touchdown. In his career, he had a total of 770 tackles, 32 interceptions, and 14 forced fumbles, along with three touchdowns. 
the USC alum also won two Super Bowls with the Steelers in 2006 and 2009. Congratulations to Troy Polamalu and all the other 2020 NFL Hall of Fame inductees. And that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll tune in again next week. Be sure to go back on YouTube and watch previous episodes. I'm Jake Fitzgerald. And I'm Brandon Thomas and we'll see you again really soon.